Imagine this. You're deep in the forests of Borneo in the days before TV, radio, and wildlife magazines. Gradually, you become aware of something looking at you, curiously and intelligently. What would you make of it? For Alfred Russell Wallace, an English naturalist in the 1850s, the sight of animals such as the orangutan made him realize how closely man is related to the natural world. During an eight-year voyage around the Malaya archipelago, collecting and observing the many species of the region, Wallace put forward the idea that species adapt to fit their environment. They're shaped both by other species and by the physical environment. Together with Charles Darwin, who'd come up with the same idea a few years earlier, he recognized that over a long period of time, wildlife evolves into different forms. Every one of us watching this film is approximately 98% orangutan. Wallace and Darwin were not the first to recognize the closeness of the orangutan to man. The local inhabitants of Borneo, the Dayak, had more intuitively grasped the idea through their many creation myths. In one, they talk of great bird-like deities who created all the world's form. After creating man, they were so pleased with their handiwork, they held a great feast to celebrate. In the morning, when they recovered from their excesses, they tried to make more of these creatures, but alas, had forgotten one ingredient. Instead of humans, they made the orangutan. The evolutionary origin of the orangutan is a fascinating tale, spanning millions of years over different continents. The story begins deep in the tropical forests of Africa, where a common ancestor for all today's great apes emerged from a tree-dwelling primate looking a bit like a modern-day tree shrew. Gorillas, humans, and orangutans all took form. About 15 million years ago, the orangutans as a distinct group split off from this ancestor and expanded their range moving out of Africa and into the forests of southern Asia. Today, the orangutan is only found in parts of Borneo and Sumatra, where about 30,000 individuals are believed to exist. Orangutans are the largest arboreal animal in the world. Unlike chimpanzees and gorillas which have adapted to life on the ground, orangutans are dependent on the trees for speedy passage. With hip joints as flexible as their shoulders and feet like hands, they can use all four limbs to grasp onto branches. Such an arboreal lifestyle has made them very difficult to study for earthbound humans. They remain the most mysterious of the great apes. One of the first people to undertake a long-term study of the orangutan was a young Canadian graduate, Baruti Galdikas. It takes a very special kind of person to set up a research station in the heart of the jungle studying these elusive apes. Baruti Galdikas was a young anthropology graduate when she arrived more than two decades ago in Borneo. Working in difficult conditions, she's dedicated her life to studying orangutans in the wild. Orangutans are found in a multitude of different forest types. All of them, of course, are primary tropical rainforest. Uh, in Borneo, we have uh, tropical heath forests, we have peat swamp forests, we have lowland uh, diptocarp forests, uh, and a variety of other types as well. But here in Tanjung Puting, rotans are found in tropical heath forest and peat swamp forest, 
Occasionally, they're found in Nipah mangrove associations. And it appears, from what the local people say, from what the Dayaks say, from what my husband says, that orangutans are creatures of the lowlands. As you go up further into the mountains of Borneo, into the rugged heart of Borneo, one discovers that orangutan populations uh, drop precipitously. And the few times I've been in the heart of Borneo, the local Dayaks say, well, we see orangutans occasionally, but they only come here when there is fruit. The rainforest canopy provides abundant resources for animals that live there. Orangutans are known to eat at least 400 different types of food. Most of these are fruits, but orangutans also eat bark, leaves, and occasionally insects. Due to the patchy distribution of fruit, orangutans have developed a semi-solitary lifestyle to ensure that each individual gets enough to eat. The trees here do not come into fruit all at once, so orangutans need to have an extensive mental map of where fruit trees are and when they fruit. This ability to memorize the layout of the forest is an indication of the orangutan's great intelligence. It's the kind of knowledge that takes a long time to acquire. Young orangutans spend the first eight years of their life close to their mothers, gradually learning from her the ways of the forest. The young orangutan somehow piece together how best to move around safely. It's as well that even at this early age, its grip is as firm as an adult human. These early years are a time of close bonding with their mother. As siblings and other young orangutans are rarely present, the mother can devote all of her attention to the youngster. It's often the case of knowing when to let the youngster have a free reign and when to call it in. The birth of another baby often hastens the push to independence, and by six or seven, the young orangutan must be competent in forest skills, such as how to fashion a comfortable mattress out of branches and leaves mashed together, something that every orangutan does each dusk, and sometimes during the day. Not until he's about 15 will the young male develop the fleshy cheek pads and throat pouch of the sexually active adult male. The enlarged throat pouch enables him to roar into the forest with a sound that drowns all the others. The call advertises his presence to females and alerts other males. Just as the forest shapes the orangutan, so the forest itself is shaped by the activities of the orangutan. The orangutans are rather messy eaters, dropping seeds or dispersing them undigested once they have passed through their gut. Either way, it helps scatter seeds where they can flourish away from the parent tree. There are other ways in which the orangutan shape the forest. Branches are often dislodged, creating gaps in the canopy. Then the dark world of the forest floor lights up, encouraging new growth. interact is just one example of plants and animals working together to create the complex world of the tropical forest ecosystem. 
Each species, from the smallest termite to the largest tree, plays a part. The forest is a recycling system on a grand scale. Fallen logs, leaves and debris are all rapidly broken down by decomposers. First are usually the anthropods, such as the rhinoceros beetle, weight for weight the most powerful animal in the world. Its strong mandibles shred the wood with ease. This leaves the wood open to invasion by other groups, such as fungi. Root-like extensions tunnel through the substrate, breaking down the organic matter and taking the decomposition process one step further. An extensive network of plant roots of many different shapes and sizes capture the nutrients released by the fungi and rapidly recycle them into new growth. Unlike a temperate forest, most nutrients here are close to the surface, so roots are very shallow. The great wealth of the forest is in the trees, not the soil. The canopy is like a giant solar panel, capturing the energy from the sun. Tree crowns are filled with aerial walkways for animals, such as long-tailed macaques and silver laguerotes. Under the canopy, the tree branches and trunks act like roof gardens for nature's botanical hitchhikers. On the forest floor beneath the dense foliage, other plants survive in the humid atmosphere. The forest acts as a sponge, soaking up 95% of the annual rainfall. Much of this is stored in a loose matter of roots and soil. From there, it's taken up by the roots and released through the leaves to create rain again. The remaining 5% of the rainfall trickles into the river, providing a steady flow of water year-round. If the forest is cleared, the huge deluge of water during the rainy season cannot be stored. Instead, it will rush straight off the land, bursting riverbanks and flooding homes. The turnover of forest and nutrients is so rapid that the soil does not have time to build up a reserve of riches, and so the tropical forest soil is unsuited to agriculture. Even with applications of lime and fertilizer, the cleared land can usually only support a couple of harvests before the soil becomes degraded. Agriculture may not be very profitable, but mining is more so. Gold, diamonds and other gems are all found beneath the forest here in Kalimantan in Indonesia. At Aspai, a small settlement just north of Tanjan Putting National Park, the ground has been extensively gorged to extract gold. Such high impact means that the regeneration of the forest with any diversity is unlikely. of mercury in the Sikonya River became so high that the authorities were forced to take action and close down the mine. But the biggest threat to the forest habitat is logging. Tropical wood is prized worldwide. In this one activity alone, man influences the environment far more than any other animal. seems insatiable. Day after day, logging trains like this take their product to the outside world. Taking all the trees from the forest destroys it forever. Removing only the largest, known as selective logging, is preferable but even this destroys many other trees in the process.
To service the industry, roads and railways have to be built, making it easier for hunters, developers, and settlers to move into the forest. For orangutans, the arrival of logging can mean the beginning of the end. Adults are occasionally shot for food. More often, the mothers are shot, and the babies are taken from them to be sold locally as pets. Although illegal, the trade in pet orangutans is very difficult to control. If they're lucky, young orangutan will be rescued from their human owners and placed in rehabilitation centers for ex-captives. One of the first rehabilitation centers for returning orangutans to the wild was set up here by Dr. Galdikan in Tanjan Putting National Park in central Kalimantan in Indonesia. Now it is run by the Ministry of Forestry. Mr. Mawin is the vet in charge of the ex-captives. In Tanjung Puting National Park, we have three sites of rehabilitation center. The first site is uh, Tanjung Harapan. We have seven orangutans here, ex-captive orangutans. And Tono Tangwi, the second one, we have six, uh, 17 orangutans. And at Kamliki, total, we have 47 orangutans, but only five orangutans taken care intensively by the rangers. Orangutans suffer from many of the same diseases as humans. Every orangutan is given a medical to ensure that it's free from infectious diseases that it may have caught from contact with humans. Skin diseases are also prevalent. The hot, humid atmosphere of the tropics is well suited to the growth of fungal infections. After three months quarantine, the young orangutan can begin its reintroduction to the wild. But it's not as simple as you might think. Despite its instinctive ability to grasp, for the young orangutan used to cages and chains, trees can seem very, very frightening. Once the young orangutans have relearned the basics, they join the older group deep in the forest. So, they're still dependent on the rangers for food. To date, more than 100 orangutans have been rehabilitated by Dr. Galdikas. And along with the Orangutan Foundation, she's been successfully working to end the cruel trade in baby orangutans. And she hopes one day to make these kind of rehabilitation centers obsolete. If all goes to plan, these orangutans will gradually start collecting their own fruit and readapt to the wild, which is a tribute to orangutan intelligence that they can make these transition at all. Yes, um... Their progress is carefully monitored as they return to the wild, as is the impact of the new introduction on the wild population already there. The fact that orangutans attract tourists may help to save them. Almost 2,000 visitors come to Tanjan Putting National Park each year to see the forest and orangutans. This brings new jobs and gives local people an economic reason for saving the forest rather than destroying it. For many people, Tanjan Putting offers their first opportunity of seeing an orangutan and often without going too far into the park. Ah, <laughs> 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 
Many of us who watch these intelligent apes are surprised to discover how much of ourselves we see in them. Orangutans are adept at copying humans. They'll wash your jeans for you, and even clean up afterwards. But you have to be careful, or they'll pinch the soap as well. Eating it fortunately does them no harm. Tanjin Putting National Park and others like it are important refuges for endangered species like the orangutan. They are the front line in the conservation effort. People talk about various conservation and various animal welfare issues. And in the minutia of details, it's very easy to forget that there basically is only one major issue. And that major issue is habitat. Dr. Galdekat is clear about the effect the continued loss of habitat would have upon these, the gentlest giants of the forest canopy. There is, she feels, only one hope, the survival of the species in the wild. If forests such as this can be preserved, then the orangutan species has a future as a species in the wild. If forests such as this are cut down or converted into other uses, then the orangutan species, as a species, has no hope. Individual orangutans may continue to exist in zoos and captivity or in small, very isolated populations that will be almost like outdoor safari parks. But what we need to preserve is the habitat, habitat such as this. As Darwin and Wallace first acknowledged, the world is constantly changing. Species become extinct, while others thrive in the pressure house of natural selection. Some might argue that extinction of a few species is a small price to pay for human advancement. Others would question whether progress at such cost is true progress at all. <laughs> 